Now last time we, we looked at verses 20 and 21, but 20 through 23 is a section in which Jude, the, Jude actually ends writing about these that are trying to infiltrate the believer and would try to draw away the believer. And, and uh, so the book is mostly a warning about, he keep calling them these, uh, certain men that, that crept in among them, uh, that, that's Paul's terms. Uh, verse 4 says, for there are certain men, oh, it does, crept in unawares who were before old of old ordained to this condemnation. So he's been warning about those men. But he began to be an encouragement to the saints. Actually, he, uh, he began to be an encouragement back, backing up to verse uh, 15, uh, 17, where he gives the uh, admonition to remember the words of the apostles. So in a sense, there's an encouragement from the apostles who have written to them, which tells us a reminder that Jude is a, is a tribulation epistle, and the apostles are the twelve apostles, and particularly that verse 17 matches identical to uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, where Peter says the very things that, that, that Jude is writing about, so he's certainly referring to Peter's writings there. But beginning in verse 20, he, he leaves them to encourage themselves. Uh, there's going to encouragement among themselves. Verse 20 says, but... Uh, but, ye bro- but ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And of some have compassion making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh." Now, it's actually, we studied verse 20 last time. It's verse 21 that we're going to study today because there's four things where when he tells them to, uh, about them building themselves up, we, we emphasize the fact that the word themselves in verse 20, but ye beloved, building up yourselves. And then in verse 21, keep yourselves in the love of God. That it's not yourself, but yourselves in the sense that the, the saints are gathering together and ministering to each other. And in the tribulation, we read in the book of Jude how important it is for them not, Jude, the book of Hebrews, not to forsake the assembling of themselves together, especially as they see the day approaching. And the day we're talking about is the tribulation and how they're going to need each other's encouragement to make it through that time. So after he directs them uh, from the apostles. He now encourages them to build themselves up. And we were looking at verse 20 uh, last time and verse 21 this time. But we, we said from the beginning, if you'll notice those words in there, there it's building and then praying. And I added an I, ing to the first word in verse 21. Keeping and then uh, uh, looking. So the thing that he's encouraging them to do is the building themselves up. They're going to be praying in the Holy Ghost. They're going to be keeping themselves in the love of God. And they're going to be looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And, uh, and that's the encouragement that he gives to them. It switches, if you'll notice, in verse 22 where it says, and some. And I think uh, when we get to that point, I'll, I'll try to point out to you, I don't think that's some of you. I think it's some others as you read in verse 23, and others save. So it's not the themselves, it's they have a ministry among themselves and they have a ministry outside of themselves. And that's the difference between those uh, two sets of verses, uh, between 21, 20 and 21 and 22 and 23. So when we were looking at the verse 20, just when it says, uh, building up yourselves in, in your most holy faith, uh, the, uh, the holy faith as we were looking at it, has to be in God's holy word. <laughs> Their faith has to be in what God said, but particularly we kept saying what God has said to them. For, for them to have holy faith, it has to be faith in God's holy word to them. And then when it says praying in verse 20, uh, 21, praying is, uh, no, 20. When it, when it talks about praying, praying is living, uh, uh, li, li, uh, is praying in line with what the Holy Ghost has revealed in God's Word. It's not separate from that. That's what we we looked at praying in the Holy Ghost. What does that mean? It's the Holy Spirit wrote God's Word, and they're going to be studying what God said to them and praying those things to God, what He 
what he said he would do for them, what he's going to do with them, what he warned them about, like those words of the apostles that verse 17 and 18 are talking about. So uh, there, we already talked about uh, building themselves up and praying in the Holy Ghost. Now we get down to verse 21 where it says, keep yourselves in the love of God. What, when it says keep yourselves in the love of God, one of the things I was saying to Brandon, I said it at the beginning of last time, because it hit me more than, than, than at the beginning of the book of Jude. I knew the book of Jude is written, and it's real. there's some interesting verses, there's some difficult verses, but it's, it's, verse, it's written to tribulation saints. But what I, what I began to realize is how different the wor- wording here is from the doctrine of grace. For instance, hold your place in Jude. Get uh, Romans uh, chapter 8. Now I pointed this out last time. I said you can compare Romans chapter 4 with James chapter 2 or Romans 4, uh, you're, you're saved, uh, righteousness is imputed to you, you're justified by not working. You read the book of James and it's, it's you're not justified by faith only. <laughs> and you go, what? There's such a difference there. And, and you, you read so many things that are so different when you read Israel's letters when you read Israel's doctrine, when you read tribulation epistles as compared to living in the dispensation of grace. And there's several of those incidences that are different. Um, we studied on Sunday. Uh, what, are we looking for his appearing or are we looking for his coming to the earth? And, uh, and we're looking for his appearing. They're looking for his coming to the earth. You see that even in the book of Jude. But, but here's one. In Romans chapter 8, as Paul is concluding the chapter, and actually a conclusion, the first eight chapters of the book of Romans, he says in verse 35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long, we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now look at Jude, verse 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God. (laughs) Could anything be any more different than that? (laughs) We got in grace, there's nothing Things present, things to come, no creature, not even yourself, can separate you from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus, and that's where you are, you're in Christ. But the writer of Jude tells them, keep yourselves in the love of God. And, and you know, so, so when you're studying that, you've got to realize, you go, wait a minute, there's something different here. <laughs> and what does that mean? How do they keep themselves in the love of God? Well, there's a couple ways to, that, that it means for them. To keep, sometimes the word keep has to do with guard, as in the word watch. And, uh, and certainly that is something that they are instructed to do. So concerning, con- looking at their epistles, what this would mean to keep themselves in the love of God, look over in James chapter 1. It says, and that's just a couple books before, James 1 says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Now David's out there in, in the foyer, but uh, uh, he's been studying this spotted stuff because it comes up twice in the book of Jude and we're going to come up to it again in just a, a in a couple weeks or a few weeks, uh, but unspotted from the world is there is a uh, well, there's a spot coming to the world that these people need to keep themselves unspotted from the world. They can't be a part of the world system, especially in the last days. And, and so there's a keeping themselves that, that might apply to that phrase, keep your, yourselves in the love of God. And you'll see that it does as we look at some other verses. But I want to show you these verses because we have to read their epistles to start thinking like them based on their doctrine, their most holy faith. 
Because our doctrine comes from Paul's epistles in the dispensation of grace, and it causes us to think a different way because of, of our standing in grace. Now, they have a standing, and they have grace, uh, but the, the epistles, the, the tribulation epistles, read differently because of the things they face. For instance, Revelation chapter 1. And that, that's why I think it's important for us to read these verses so that we start thinking like they think if we're going to study their epistles, realizing it's their doctrine, but we have the opportunity to study it. So in, in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3, when this letter is being written, uh, it says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of, the pro of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. So when, you know, we talked about building yourselves up in the most holy faith, that's faith in what God said to them. Praying in the Spirit is praying that information back to God, communing with God in the doctrine that He has revealed. And now when we're talking about keep yourselves in the love of God, it's keeping yourself in that doctrine, guarding that doctrine, watching out that someone doesn't take you away from that doctrine, because here in the book of Revelation, as they're going to face the tribulation, the ones who are going to be blessed, blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of the prophecy, of this prophecy, and they don't just hear it, just like James says, they have to keep it. And keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. The thing he's going to warn them about, they've got to keep themselves in the doctrine, in the Word of God, what God said to them, and not be led astray, which uh, has been a, a warning all through the book of Jude. So, so they have to keep themselves. Now, come over to 1 Peter, chapter 4. In verse 7, you'll see how they all match. They all have the same warnings. It says, But the end of all things is at hand. Be therefore sober and watch unto prayer. I told you, keeping is to guard or to watch. And that's, we're here because of that word watch in there. And, and interesting, it says, not only do they need to be sober, but it says, and watch unto prayer. Sober is not being intoxicated by the world system. Not, it's not just alcohol. You can be intoxicated by the world system, thinking like the world. So you need to think soberly based on what God has said. But it, watch unto prayer. So you see the same idea where Jude is saying to pray in the Spirit and then keep yourselves in the love of God. So they're, wa they're watching and they're praying. goes on to say, and above all things, uh, have fervent charity among yourselves. There's that yourselves part. Uh, for charity shall cover a multitude of sins. Yeah, I, back before we were studying the book of 1 Corinthians and we studied the word charity and I was trying to show the difference between charity and love. There is a slight difference between the two. But we always say love covers a multitude of sin, don't we? The Bible never says that. That verse says charity covers a multitude of sins. <laughs> Because I, I was looking for that verse, I couldn't find it. I'm thinking, why come I can't find it? I found out it doesn't say love, it says charity. And uh, there, is, there is a little bit of difference, I'm not going into that. Verse 9 says, use hospitality one to another without grudging. <laughs> you, you realize that these saints have got to help each other out during some pretty hard times. In fact, the hard time, look at verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when His glory shall be revealed, you may be glad with exceeding joy. Yeah, I think you'd have exceeding joy at the end of the tribulation when He shows up. <laughs> you go through that tribulation, but as they're facing that, the same instructions about helping each other, praying and watching, uh, is, is all there. So that's what He's talking about. Now watch, come over to... Luke, the Lord taught this. Luke chapter 21. No, yeah, it's 21. It has the same language as the, the sower and the seed, but this is a different place here. Luke 
In verse uh, 34 of Luke 21, it says, And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with fretting and drunkenness and cares of this life, so that that day come upon you unawares. Now Israel's doctrine is they're not looking, they're not living in the age of grace, going to be raptured out before the wrath comes. They're going to go through the tribulation. And, and there's going to be a lot of fretting and a lot of overcharged hearts during that time. And uh, he's warning them not to let that happen. Verse 35 says, For as a snare shall it come upon all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore, and pray, there's the watch and pray again, uh, that ye may be counted worthy to escape all these things that shall, come upon, that shall come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. Endure through the tribulation, and be there when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. So the Lord taught that, and then as they're getting closer to it in the tribulation epistles, Peter, James, Jude, Revelation, it's all saying the same thing, preparing them for that, implying what it means to keep themselves in the love of God. Now, it actually means a little bit more than that. And the, these verses, uh, I think they might surprise you, because I've shared them before, back when I was talking about God's love one time. And, but watch this. Come to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. You know, it used to be that uh, like Gideons and, and others, they would, rather than pass out Bibles, now Gideons would pass out Bibles, uh, but they used to make a lot of just the book of John. And people would just pass out the book of John because, of course, John is, you know, the love of God and, and it shows the deity of Christ. But everyone, you know, thinks about John 3.16. And even though the cross isn't explained in John 3.16, it talks about believing and not perishing. But that's because in the tribulation, those who don't believe are going to perish. They're not going to be here when Jesus Christ comes back. That's what that verse is about. But my point to you is, there's verses in John that are very strange verses. And, you know, if you were really going to just pass out one book, like a, uh, you're going to take one book of the Bible and use that to try to get people saved, the book of Romans. That's where the gospel is explained. It's not really explained in the, in the book of John. But they think, they think of John as the disciple whom Jesus loved and, and, and being a book, uh, what, the gospel that would show what love is. Well, remember, we're studying the phrase, keep yourselves in the love of God. What do you got to do to keep yourselves in the love of God? Well, John chapter 14, verse 21. It says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will make my, myself manifest unto him. Judas said unto him, not Iscariot, see there's another Judas that's an apostle, Lord, how is it that thou wilt make thyself, uh, will manifest thyself to us, and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. You know, that sounds like conditional love, doesn't it? If, if, you, if you love Jesus Christ, then you'll keep his commandments, and the Father will love you, and he will love you, and then he'll take up his abode with you. I mean, that's what the verse has said. So to keep yourselves in the love of God is to keep the commandments that Jesus Christ gave to them. And if you don't keep yourself, he's not going to come and abide. By the way, you know, when it talks about the Father and the Son will come and make their abode with him, he's not going to manifest himself to the world, but he's going to manifest himself to them. What he, I've always looked at this verse. Look back up at verse 16. It says, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Now the Comforter, he's talking about the Holy Spirit, that when Jesus Christ leaves, he's going to give them the Holy Spirit, verse 17. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you uh, comfortless, I will come to you. 
Now that last phrase, I will come to you, that is either talking about his second coming, because he is going to come to them himself, physically, but down in that verse 23 there, about the Father and the Son will come and dwell in them, and he says another comforter, and then he says, I will come unto you. When the Holy Spirit comes unto them, you don't separate the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is the representation of God the Father and God the Son in the believer. Not physically, because Jesus Christ is physically in the heavens. God the Father dwells everywhere all at once, so he's not just in, in the believer. So, uh, so, but when I look at verse 18, I've always thought of that. I will come unto you and think, is he talking about the second coming, or is he saying I'm going to come back to you in the form of the Holy Spirit? And when you get down to verse 23, I think that's what he's talking about. But don't get past the point that when he talks about that love, you're going to see it again several places here. These chapters, 14, 15, and 16, are all about the Holy Spirit. We've pointed that out before. Come over to chapter 15 and verse 9. It says, As the Father hath loved me, so I have loved you. Continue in my love. Oh, that's what we're learning to do, aren't we? If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Now, there's, he gets down to some specific about sharing that love, love one another, but the first part about that, for their joy to be fulfilled, they need to keep in his love, and to keep in his love is to keep his word, his commandments, to do what he said, and you're going to stay in his love, and when you stay in his love, your joy is going to remain in you. So he, he's actually encouraging them to take the word that I'm giving you, and not just pray about it, but keep it. And uh, so keeping, you know, we talk about guard, but it's almost like keep his commandments. That's what you keep reading here, and that's how you abide in his love. Uh, come over to chapter 16. Verse 25. You know, when people who don't rightly divide the word of truth and have spent maybe more time in the Gospels than in Paul's epistles, or equal time in both, and haven't separated in their minds the two different dispensations, you, you would then think, you would, you would mix the gospel up and your security up with these words, rather than, like we start out with that Romans 8, nothing can separate you from the love of God that's in Christ. These verses sounds like something could separate you. Then you've got to make sure you keep in his word and keep his commandments, because only then will he love you and make his abode with you. Any, anyhow, like, you wouldn't have sound doctrine, is my point, if you don't rightly divide the word of truth. Verse 25 of, of John chapter 16. It says, These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of my Father. At that day ye shall ask, uh, ask in my name, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loveth you because ye have loved me and have believed that I am come out from God. I am come forth of, uh, from the Father and have come uh, uh, into the world. Again, I leave the world and go unto, my father, go unto the Father. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly. And, knowest, and speaketh no proverb. Now we are sure that thou knowest all things, and needeth not that any man should ask thee, but this we, be, uh, but this we believe, that thou camest forth from God. Jesus answered, uh, answered them, Do you n now believe? And he warns them that they, when he gets arrested, they're going to be running from him. But uh, that's just the point, because he's gonna, they're going to regroup after that. But that's, that statement there about... Uh, the Father loves them because they love Jesus Christ, and not just love Jesus Christ, but believe that he came from God, that he came out from the Father. And they testify, yes, we believe you came out from the Father. That Remember, we're talking about a tribulation epistle. Keep yourselves in the love of God. God's love is in his Son. 
And if you love his son, the father loves you. And not just the love, it's, it's, it's not only believing in the son, but believing that he came out from the father. Jesus is the one who came out from the father. And that's what they're believing. Because in the tribulation, there's going to be another man who's going to claim to be the Christ. And you know how you don't keep yourselves in the love of God? You start believing this Antichrist is the real Christ. You do that, God the Father don't love you. <laughs> and there's going to be a judgment there. So now there's, there's, there's more power because the Holy Spirit is going to help them stay in that love and stay in that doctrine. But what we're studying there in the book of Jude about uh, building themselves up in the Holy Faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, and keep yourselves in the love of God, all has to do with the doctrine that God gave them and them staying in that doctrine and remaining in that doctrine, believing who Jesus Christ is so that their joy might be full and, and that he'll come back to them. And, uh, and so that's, I mean, there's verses that would explain exactly what it means uh, to love Christ. In fact, look at one more. Look at Revelation chapter 14. Compare what we just saw in John chapter 16 with Revelation 14. And this is the passage that warns about the judgment that's going to come to those who take the mark of the beast. It starts out, Revelation 14 verse 6. I believe the 144,000 are taken off the earth at this point. And in verse 6 it says, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the uh, everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, and say unto them with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of the waters. And so there's a warning who to fear because there's an Antichrist that chapter 13 introduced us to that is going to come on the scene is going to take your head off if you don't bow down and worship him. So the angel is warning the world, and it's called the everlasting gospel, not to be afraid of that Antichrist, but to fear God. When it says, uh, verse 9, it says, The third angel followed, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in their forehead or in their hand. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they shall have no rest, day or night, which worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth his mark, the mark of his name. Now watch verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. That is, they're not going to fear the Antichrist. They're the ones who are going to keep the commandment of God. They're going to love Jesus Christ. They're not going to love the Antichrist. They're not going to fear the Antichrist. They're not going to even fear death. Now verse 13, I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the, the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. <laughs> blessed are the dead. <laughs> these people followed Jesus Christ even unto death. And, uh, and these are the ones who kept themselves in the love of God, the love of the Father by loving the Son, and believing who he is, Jesus Christ is, rather than being deceived by the Antichrist. That's the warning of the book of Jude, when it says, keep yourselves uh, in the love of God. So the other part of verse 21 of Jude says, the last part there is, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. So they're building themselves up, they're praying, they're going to keep themselves in the love of God. And the fourth thing he says, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ uh, unto eternal life. And looking for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ, their hope is that second coming of Jesus Christ to the earth. And I say that even though Sunday I talked about there's one coming of Christ. And this is one of those verses. I mean, Paul talks about the coming of the Lord. Jude talks about the coming of the Lord. But they're talking about two different aspects. Uh, when Paul talks about the coming of the Lord, it's glorious. 
Here they're going to go through tribulation, and then it becomes glorious when he finally comes to the earth after that tribulation time. But anyhow, this, they're looking for the, the coming of Jesus Christ to the earth, and, and they're going to be looking for that. They're going to be looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Because for them, when he comes back, that's when the new covenant is established. That's when resurrection unto life takes place. That's when they have eternal life as a present possession. Now, not, not to say that they don't have the Holy Spirit already, but that, that's, they're looking for that kingdom to come because that's where they have life. The rich young ruler. What good thing must I do that I might have eternal life? And the Lord says, if you enter into the kingdom, well, he actually says, hardly will a rich man enter into the kingdom of heaven. So to have eternal life is to enter into that kingdom. And they're waiting for Jesus Christ to come back. They're looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. He's coming back to set up the kingdom. This is, this is when the Apostle Paul in Romans 11, he says in verse 25, uh, that we shouldn't be ignorant of this mystery of the age of grace, lest you should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, and so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, he's going to send a deliverer out of Zion, and he's going to fulfill his promises made to their fathers. After this dispensation of grace is over, and Jesus Christ turns back, there's the judgment of the tribulation, and he comes back, and he actually comes back to save the nation of Israel. Did you read Zechariah 14 last week? Sunday I didn't have time to look at all the verses I was telling you about, but Zechariah chapter 14 not is where he says his feet are going to touch on the Mount of Olives in that day, but it, but it, uh, it talks about when he, when he comes back, the verse before that, verse 3, says he's, he's going to gather all the armies against Jerusalem, and then he comes back and saves Israel from those armies. And that's when Israel is going to be saved. That's when their sins are going to be forgiven them. That's when Israel is going to become the nation God called them to be. So that's what Jude is telling them to look for. They're going to keep themselves in the love of God by not following the Antichrist, and they're going to be looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. That's when he comes back to them and saves them, and that's when all Israel shall be saved. That's when their sins shall be forgiven them, and that's when the tribulation epistles, that's when the uh, apostles to the nation of Israel spoke about their salvation. For instance, go back to 1 Peter chapter 1. See, we, look at, we, we always understand salvation in the sense of being saved and sealed with the Holy Spirit and having eternal life in the sense of being saved from the penalty of our sins. But it also, when Paul talks about, uh, like the, the rapture, that uh, God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. We have a future salvation. When we get raptured, we physically go into salvation. Well, they, they, have a, they have the hope of salvation through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But their salvation, they're looking for Jesus Christ to come back to physically save them and set up that kingdom. And you see it in these epistles. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6, it says, Wherein we greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, see, he's preparing them for going through that tribulation, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Now he's talking about that Jesus Christ coming back at the end, watch. Whom having not seen, ye loved. In whom now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your, uh, the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. So he's coming back and he's going to save them and, and physically into that kingdom. Their sins, that's when the nationally their sins are forgiven them. If you look at verse 13 of the same chapter, it says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind and be sober and hope unto the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. See how that reads different? We're already in the grace of God. We live in the dispensation. But there's a grace that's coming to the nation of Israel at the revelation of Jesus Christ when he comes back to this earth. And that's, that's when they, they have that eternal life. 
That, that's what, that's, they're waiting for that end, and they're looking, and they're told to look for that end. That actually would protect them, keeping them in the love of God, because they know that time's coming. Since I'm going to show you later, let's look at now, at 1 Peter chapter 5, in verse 6. It says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that ye may be exalted in due time. Cast all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Now that's physically going to be true in the tribulation when Satan is cast out of heaven into the earth. And he's going to go out to devour any, especially of the Jews, he's trying to destroy the whole nation, but any believing Jew, he's out to devour them. So he says in verse 9, whom, whom, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal, uh, eternal glory by Jesus Christ, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Well, that glory and dominion, that's how the book of Jude is going to end. And we're talking about Jesus Christ coming back to save the nation of Israel after the tribulation. And that's what Jude is referring to there when it says looking for, um, uh, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Since we're looking at verses, you're in Peter, just go back a couple more books. Hebrews chapter 9. Again, so that you realize that the book of Hebrews is writing about this time. I think verse 27 is so misused, but won't get into that now. Verse 27 says, of Hebrews 9, it says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and to them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So he's coming back again. But uh, the only ones that he's coming back to save are those that are looking for him. And that's what Jude is saying, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal uh, life. So they're to look for that time. Um, go to James, the book after Hebrews, James chapter 5. And if anything is getting established, it's how this, these epistles, Hebrews through Revelation, are certainly tribulation epistles. L listen to these verses. James chapter 5, beginning in verse 7. It says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth. Uh, that would be a farmer waiting for the crops to be ripe, the fruit to be ripe. Waiteth for the precious uh, fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it until he received the early and latter rain. Be, be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth not nigh. Gird, uh, gir, uh, grudge not uh, one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth at the door. Uh, let me keep reading. Take my brethren, uh, uh, take my brethren the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord, for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Job is a picture of someone suffering tribulation, but Job ends up where God has blessed, doubled everything he ever had at the beginning. And so he's, he was patient, he suffered the tribulation, but that phrase, you have seen the end of the Lord. You've seen at the end of the Lord at, through Job's tribulation, and now he's encouraging these people that you're going to go through this tribulation, keep your eyes on the Lord. You've seen the end of the Lord, you know what's going to happen when he comes back. And that is the blessing is going to come to the nation of Israel at his return. So we've learned about building, praying, keeping, or keep yourselves, and looking uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, those, each one of those, 
Building yourselves up is reading and studying the Bible. Now for them it's God's Word, but just kind of take it in a, in a practical situation. Building yourselves up is reading and studying the Bible. Praying is communing with God in prayer concerning what God's Word said. Keeping yourselves, well, that's fellowship of the saints. They're, they're keeping themselves, they're, they're helping each other out in, in the times uh, uh, that they face. And then looking is looking for that hope. Their hope is, is the second coming, ours is the rapture. Now, the reason I said that, those four things. You know, when I went to Bible college, now they didn't quite teach it in a gracious way, but they always instructed us that there's four things that you need to always be on guard to be doing. And they, they always said, you need to be uh, reading your Bible, you need to be, always be fellowshipping with the saints, you need to always be witnessing, or you always need to be praying, and you always need to be witnessing. We, evangelism was real stressed at, at the school I went to. But we always judged our spiritual life based on, are we doing those four things? Well, you could do those four things and not be spiritual. Spiritual is doing them because God's motivating it all. So there's the grace motivation. But I've always judged my life. I've always stopped and say, wait a minute, you've been reading? You've been studying the scripture? Well, the job I have helps me do that. <laughs> but praying is a little bit different. Or fellowship with the saints. I mean, I, I got to because I'm paid to. <laughs> uh, but that's not why. But I mean, that's an important part. And then witnessing, that's one, between the praying and the witnessing, I, always working on myself, hey, don't, don't let up on that. Uh, so anyhow, when I, when I, I say that to you, because it kind of pops up here, because the, the, the three things, the first three things there, of the reading of the Bible, and the praying, and the fellowshipping, uh, well, that is building, praying, and keeping yourselves. And then in Jude, let me just point this out to you, we're not going to study it. But in Jude, the next two verses say, and of some have compassion, making a difference. And I've already told you, I think that's not some of you guys. I think it's the some others, other than yourselves. That's why verse 23 says, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. In a sense, I look at that and I go, oh, there's the witnessing. So it's got all those four elements right here for the kingdom saints and things that we should be involved in. And... Uh, and, and so the, the, we're going to do that transfer from themselves, the ministry to themselves, to the ministry of others when we pick up back up in verses 22 and 23. Can I show you one more thing? Come back to me, with me to Micah chapter 7. Now you have to hunt that one down. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah. The reason I say that to you is we just got done reading about looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. They're looking for the mercy, and then he's going to tell them to have compassion on others. Compassion is to have pity and mercy. We already saw the Lord is very pitiful, pitiful, that he has pity, and he does have mercy. I just want to share with you because when we talk about those other two verses, we're going to talk about the saints showing that mercy. But... He's already talked about the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it relates to the second coming of Christ. And Micah has got a beautiful passage of Scripture here that talks about that mercy. Micah chapter 7. First of all, notice verse 6 and see if it rings a bell to you. For the son dishonoreth the father, and the daughter rises up against the mother, and the daughter-in-law against the mother-in-law, and men's enemies are... Uh, are the men's of his own house. Anybody remember that verse? We talked about how there's going to be a separation that takes place back in the book of Jude, that there, within a household there's going to be a tax against believers. Now there it is in the Old Testament. The Lord is actually quoting that passage. But verse 7 starts out this way. It says, Therefore I will look unto the Lord. So here's Micah. He, he knows that they're going to go through this tribulation time, and there's going to be these attacks that are going to go on. Uh, the previous verses talks about perishing and judgment and all. It says, Therefore I will look unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Rejoice not against me, O my enemy, when I fall. I shall rise when I, shall, when I sit in darkness. The Lord shall be a light unto me. 
I will bear the uh, uh, indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him. It, the tribulation is chastening to the nation of Israel, but those that endure the chastening, then, then comes the fruit. It says, I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he pleadeth my, co- my cause and executeth judgment for me. He will bring me forth unto light, and I shall behold his righteousness. Then he talks about the judgment that's going to fall on the lost people of the world. Uh, and it goes all the way down to verse 17. Uh, and then verse 18, it talks about him. He's waiting for the Lord. He's looking for the Lord. And then it says, verse 18, Who is God like unto thee, that pardoneth iniquity, and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighteth in mercy. Looking for that mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. That's what Micah is doing. He will turn again. He will have compassion on us. He will subdue our iniquity, and thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. There's the forgiveness of the nation of Israel. Thou wilt perform the truth to Jacob, and the mercy to Abraham, which thou, which thou hast shown unto our fathers from the days of old. So when he says, looking for that mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life, that's from the Old Testament, looking for, they're going to they're gonna bear that indignation, they're going to bear that tribulation, they're going to endure through it, but at the end, the Lord's going to pardon all their sins, and their sins are going to be cast into the depths of the sea. And then everything God promised from their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, will all come to, to fruition, will become fulfillment, and they'll receive that blessing at the end. The end of the Lord. You remember the end of the Lord is good. So that, that's the prophetic program, and that's what Jude is writing about. So we saw what they're to do among themselves, and like I say, in a few weeks when we get back, we'll talk about uh, what they still have time to do for others, and we'll study those verses 22 and 23 uh, when we come back. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we do thank you for the opportunity to study a book like this. Thank you that there's so many other verses that those of us who rightly divide, we plug into our minds what it means to live in the dispensation of grace and how secure we are and how nothing can separate us from your love. We're not facing a trial of tribulation that's going to come upon the world at your hand. Uh, But Father, there's certainly trials and tribulation, but not at your hand. We're looking forward to be saved from the wrath that's coming. But for the kingdom saints and the doctrine given to them, it's quite different. And as we read the different passages of scriptures, we can see uh, what you have said to them to prepare them to be able to build themselves up what they're to be praying about, what they're to keep themselves from, and what they're to be looking for. And uh, Father, we thank you for the opportunity this last couple weeks to see those things. Thank you again for your grace. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.